Welcome to another segment of Provocative Conversations, destined to provoke further thought and spark greater questions regarding God, church, and the religious establishments of both the past and the present. I am the proud heretic, Mr. Provocateur himself. The All-Inclusiveness of God, Part 2. The All-Inclusiveness of God. I stopped off from Part 1 with Romans, Chapter 1, verses 16 through 17 in the New Living Translation. And again, it says, for I am not ashamed of this good news. And that's one thing that I won't be personally. I'm not ashamed of the good news. I'm not ashamed of proclaiming, declaring good news, not this bad news, not this hell fired news, not this exclusive news that's supposed to be good, not the good news of exclusion, but the good news of inclusion, complete inclusion. So. He says, I'm not ashamed of this good news about Christ. Why? Because it, the good news, the good news is the power of God at work. Maybe that's why we don't see things at work. That's part of why. But I believe something else also, and I won't get into that right now. Saving everyone who believes But the key is saving everyone, everyone, the all inclusiveness of the gospel. And it's more than, yeah, well, I know that the gospel was meant for everybody, but it ain't for everybody because everybody ain't going to be saved. Well, if that's the case, then Jesus wouldn't have died for everybody. He said, I'm not the God of the dead, but of the living. And then you may jump back over and contradict yourself now and say, well, yeah, exactly. See, those people are dead. They're not living. They're not going to live. He didn't die for them. Many are chosen, but few are called. And he didn't choose dead people. According to your scriptures, he didn't. He said he's not the God of the dead. None of it makes sense. So whenever you come up with a contradiction or something that is contrary to the good news that I am proclaiming the all inclusiveness of God. What you have to add into the equation is the person of God, the character of God, the nature of God. Does this jive with the character and nature of God? Yes, because everything about God is good. Good. Good, good. They said, good master. And Jesus said, why call me good? There's only one good. He's talking about God. Good, good. Now, good is really in the eyes of the beholder because, you know, what you and I would call bad is really good with God. You know, we look at the situation of Jesus and it looked bad, but actually with God, it was good. We look at the situation with Joseph, what his brothers did. That was bad, but in actuality, it was good. We look at what Jesus went through and how hard that was and how bad that looked. But it said it pleased the father. So, again, God takes the foolish things of this world in our mindsets to confound the wise. His ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. So saving everyone who believes, then it says the Jew first and also the Gentile. Well, that's all of us. See the inclusiveness of God. See how God was always in the business of including, not excluding. This good news tells us how God makes us right in his sight. Not that how God is making us right. Not that he hadn't made us right. We were made right before we were ever even on sight. 
because it says the lamb slain before, before. We were made right in his sight before we had ever done good or bad. That way we couldn't say it was our goodness that did this or our badness that's going to keep us from this or our lack of belief. The good news twit tells us how God makes us right in his sight. Not in your sight, not in my sight, but in his sight. God is about making people right in his sight. Your sight, how you see a thing and how you perceive a thing don't mean a hill of being, uh, whatever that means. It doesn't mean a thing. This is accomplished from start to finish by faith. It started by faith. God's faith. God's love. If you study anything on love, you're going to come over into faith. And you you study anything on faith, you're going to come over in love. Faith, which worketh by love. Love and faith work go hand in hand. Jesus said, not that you had faith in me, but that I had faith. It says, not that you love me, but that I loved you first. I first loved you. So all of this saying of what we're doing, we're not doing anything and God doesn't require us to do anything. And like I said before, whatever faith that you or I or anyone else will need, it comes about and it comes. And you know what? Neither you nor I know how much a person actually believes. Neither you nor I know that. And we cannot judge that. Period. So just let that alone. As the scripture says, it is through faith that a righteous person has life. Okay, here's my statement there through faith. Because this these, this is one of the biggest things that, you know, the other camps will come at you with through faith. Well, first of all, again, you don't know who has faith. And it's the faith of God, God's faith, God's faith carries us. We don't know how much faith the man on the cross had. We don't know. We don't know when he said, Lord, remember me when you get there. Basically, we don't know how much faith he had. Is that where he had enough faith to ask him? You don't know why he asked him that. You don't know his motive. It says man looks at the outward appearance, but God judges the motive and intent. He judges the heart. You can't see the heart. Said no man can come to the father. Didn't say no man could ask. Because there is a verse that says not all who say Lord, Lord shall enter. Now, I don't believe that's talking about heaven and all of that other stuff. But I'm just saying. Keeping along the lines of your thinking. Your lower level of thinking. It is through faith that a righteous person has life. First of all, how does a righteous person, why does a righteous person even need faith? Unless he's referring to the righteous person is righteous because he supposedly believed and now he's righteous. Now your belief overshadows grace. It overshadows love. Now it looks like you did it. Your works did it. That's not the way that it works. I'm going somewhere with these two verses that I'm reading. That's one. And here's the second one, because I want you to see something. And I want you to know something before I even begin to delve into these things. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 3 through 4, in the New Living Translation, it says it like this. It says, if the good news, now the key is the good news. It says that the good news we preach. First of all, the question is, do you preach good news? Do you preach Jesus and all that God did in and through him? If you keep into that storyline, the good news is about the heart of God. 
Remember, we don't know, honestly, if Jesus is an allegorical story, the name itself is, is a metaphor. We don't know. We don't know what it is. We claim to know, but we really don't know. Well, by faith, we know. Well, you know what? By faith, you should know that God's love is big enough and is saving enough to save all men, meaning the gospel is all inclusive. So you should know that the gospel is all inclusive. But you don't know. So you don't really know. If the good news we preach preach is hidden behind a veil, behind the veil of tradition, the veil of religion, the veil of humanity, the veil of ignorance, the veil of hell, the veil of Satan, the veil of eternal damnation. The veil of bad news, because it's definitely not good news. He said, if this good news is hidden behind a veil, it is hidden only from people who are perishing. Well, you know, that's what makes me so bold to speak out and say the things that I'm saying. Because I know that there are people out there who are hungry and are trying to put their life together and trying to put this puzzle called life together. And they're not able to do it with the segmented pieces that religion and churchology and even theology to a certain degree has handed them and said, now put this life puzzle together and it better be right and it better be according to scripture and it better be according to God. And if not, I'm sorry. But we take back all of the beginning message that we said to you in order to get you saved. How God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And all you have to do is just believe. And it's by grace that you're saved and everything. And then when you get over there. All right. Now, now, let me tell you something now. Okay. You're no longer babes. You're no longer sucking on tits now. It's time for you to grow up and get grown and start doing stuff on your own. You better know that if you want to keep your salvation, you need to work this hard and this hard. You need to do this, 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 and don't leave this or that undone. And at any time, if you choose to walk away or you choose to listen to heretics like me or whatever else, then, you know, hell will be your eternal resting place. What happened to the good news, buddy? What happened to all of that? stuff you were talking that sweet talk you were talking to woo me to get me into the bed of your altar doing your altar call and then when you experience me and then you want to throw me away then you started talking all this other stuff Mm Hmm. yeah so it makes me because i know that if somebody don't speak this good news which god is gonna have people speaking good news but if i don't speak it When I know that I'm supposed to, then there are people who are going to it's not going to stop God's salvation from doing what it does. God from being all inclusive, but people will live defeated to a certain degree here on this earth because they're not receiving the necessary understanding, the necessary enlightenment that would get them beyond the veil of religion of tradition of ministry of church of denominationalism and whatever other type schisms or isms or whatever that keeps them the pharisees and the sadducees of their lives that keep them from getting over say you don't want to enter into this truth about the good news and then you stop others who want to enter from entering in then it says then you make them twice the sons of hell as yourself and that's exactly what's happening so i don't veil this truth I speak forth this truth and I welcome what comes. We all want to be loved and we all want to be embraced and we all want to be believed as long as what we're putting out is true and it's from our conviction. 
I have no desire to lead any man wrong. I have no desire to throw a veil over the truth and then speak forth a message that would get people to liken me. I don't care whether you like me or not necessarily. You're not lace in my pockets. And even if you were, you would probably stop because there's no way that I let you lace my pockets in order that I may veil the truth. No, I don't do that. I don't sell out like that. I just want people to hear a fresh, fresh message, an ongoing message, a message that's trumped out by those in power, supposedly in power, supposedly trumped out because you can't trump out truth. You can't do anything against the truth. Really, you can't because the truth prevails. That's why I say the all inclusiveness of God and the fact that God's will shall prevail. And that's something that I'll be coming up with next to to piggyback on this here. So. It says Satan in verse four, who is the God of this world, Satan, who is the God of this world. There we go. There's that Satan. Now, you know, the sad part about this is. There's that word Satan, but when you go in the Old Testament, you don't see those words. But in the New Testament, you see this Satan, because now you have this Greek influence. You have all of this stuff that has happened over the last couple of hundred years. And now all of this has bled over even into people's interpreting of Scripture or misinterpretation of Scripture. Again, the way that you perceive God is the way that you perceive the word of God or the supposed word of God or words regarding God. So now you have Satan, who is the God of this world. You know, I thought God was the God of all the earth. But anyway, he's the God of this world. He has blinded the minds of those who do not believe. So now. It's saying, see, if you don't believe the message of the gospel, then your mind is blinded and you're not going to be able to believe. And that guy that you're listening to and those guys like Carlton Pearson and all of those and even myself, you know, those people are helping the devil to get his message across and to blind your mind so that you will never believe. Because they're saying you don't even have to believe. Let me tell you something. Again, I say to you, no God for yourself, no God from your personal dealings with God. Understand God's heart. Has God ever given you this message that you will go to hell and and that your mind is blinded? And that's why you can't believe me because the devil got your mind and all this, this devil, this Satan, this demon, this Lucifer, this evil one, this God of this world. Has God ever said that to you? Now, I know you religious ones, you're going to say, yeah, you far right ones, you're going to say, yeah, because you would you would dare lie to save face. You would dare lie and go against scripture, the very scripture that you preach in reference to and supposedly in line with in direct agreement with and you find no fault in it. But yet you find enough fault in it to not believe it when you lie. Because if you're lying, it's, it's apparent that you don't believe what the scripture says in regards to lies. You would save face and lie and say, God told you that. Then my question would be, what God? What God told you that? Mm-hmm. Well, see, the God of this Bible, well, how do you, who, who is the God of this Bible? See, you don't believe that God is sovereign and that God works through all things whether supposedly good or supposedly bad that he works through all things so if you don't believe that then how does God work through this now I have my belief in 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 regards to that and I'll speak on that at some other time uh, because I have a lot to say on that that's going to go in conjunction with this line of teaching now it says he's blinded their minds who don't believe So now if you don't believe, but again, I ask, who does not believe? Who does not believe? What makes you an unbeliever? What makes you not believe? Do you know why a person doesn't believe a certain way? 
Huh? Do you know why? No. Do you know the cumulative events that have occurred in their lives before you came to know them? No. But guess who does? God. It doesn't matter if they say they don't, they don't believe. Some people say they don't believe in God. They believe in the concept or they don't believe in the concept, but they do believe in the greaterness of something or someone. Just because they hadn't put it together in the manner in which you claim to have does not mean that they don't know God. Just because they say it doesn't mean that. Oftentimes we'll say things and we'll say stuff like, I can't go any further. And it's like, what do you mean you can't go any further? I can't go any further. And then they end up going further. So just because a person says that they don't believe a thing doesn't necessarily mean that they don't believe it. They're talking. Their humanity is talking. They're hurting. And these are just the things that they do when they hurt. So it says they are unstable to see the glorious light of the good news. They don't understand this message of the glory of Christ, who is the exact likeness of God. So Christ who is the exact likeness of God. The exact likeness of God. So whatever God is, that's what Christ is. Whatever Christ is and whatever he's shown himself to be, that's who he is. Well, if Christ is the exact likeness of God and Christ didn't come preaching bad news and he didn't come preaching hell and damnation, then I think we shouldn't. If he's not coming here with a message that excludes most and includes just a very few, then we shouldn't. Especially since we are ambassadors of Christ who was an ambassador of God, so much so that it says that he was God in the flesh. Now, if I don't speak forth, people won't be able to see the glorious light or the goodness that God has for all humanity. The all inclusiveness of God. There's no glorious light in the gospel if your gospel is about everything but good news, everything but the finished works of God in and through Christ or the concept of. I know that's hard. I know you don't want to buy that. I know it doesn't go with your religion. I don't know what to tell you. Maybe you just need to get rid of your religion. Maybe you just need to lose religion. Lose religion and find God. How about that? <laughs> to hell to actual hell with religiosity and churchism along with all its traditionalism to hell with it all. Lose religion and find the truth. Not find the truth. The truth finds you. Lose religion and believe the truth or by believing the truth. If it's not good news, it's not what God called you to do and to say and to speak. Now, also, good news, the definition of good news, it says in Christianity, good news is the gospel. It comes through a word is euangelion, euangelion, it's old English or whatever, but it, it almost sounds like we get the word evangelism from. Anyway, it's a messenger. Or the good news is of the coming 
of the kingdom of God because we don't fully understand what the coming of the kingdom of God is. Yes, I've done studies on it and I can bring, I can go over biblical verses, the biblical verses in regards to the kingdom. I studied everything that I could about the kingdom of God years ago. I sat down and I went through that Bible and I dissected it for months. And really you come up with, you come up, regardless of all that you come up with, you come up with nothing, really. <laughs> Honestly, nothing. Uh, now, I know the ones, the religious heads, the religious right who feels that they have the answer to all of these mysteries and all of these things. And I'm not even going to say that this is actually a, my a mystery. But they, they come up with all this. They'll say, what do you mean you don't have, you don't have the definition for the knowledge, for, for the kingdom of God? The kingdom of God is... Blah, blah, blah. Yeah, I know, I know, I know, I know. And you can't get nobody saved with that, right? Mm -hmm. And it don't make you do no better than what you're doing, huh? And it still doesn't make you preach good news, huh? So I, that doesn't work for me, okay? And so it's about the kingdom of God and of Jesus' death on the cross and the resurrection to restore people's relationship with God. They don't want to say all people's relationship with God. But that's that's the good news. The good news that God has already restored you to himself. Now, understand this here. This relationship, this thing is already done before you or I ever even come on the scene called life. So the Bible says a lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world. God already had you wrapped up. This thing was already taken care of before you got there. Before you got here. Before you got where you are right now in your messed up state. It relates to the saving acts of God due to the work of Jesus on the cross. That's what the good news is about. The saving acts of God due to what Jesus did and the cross or at the cross on the cross it's about his resurrection from the dead bringing reconciliation bringing atonement bringing us at one with god yet once again reconciling, and bringing us back into right relationship i don't even believe we were out of right relationship with god that's what i believe i don't believe we were out of right relationship but anyway between people and god man and god just put it this way because God is all inclusive between man and God. Okay. Good news. It speaks to, it means someone or something that is positive, encouraging, uplifting, desirable. Now, of course, you know, people say, well, yeah, what well, the Bible says, you got to be careful because, you know, in the end, people will be heaping up. They'll have itchy ears and they'll be heaping up to hear messages and preachers that will tell them what they want to hear. So people would listen to somebody like myself or Carlton, which is not wholly the truth, but people who are really wanting to go somewhere in God and who are truly hungry and at that, that crossroads in life, they do get something out of this. They do hear what others don't hear. They do take in what others don't care to take in. There is a truth there that that people are doing that. But then you also have those who have been told by their pastor or their local congregation or their local clansmen, you know, we uh, we forbid you to listen to that heretic, to listen to that type talk. That's heresy. And you will lose your salvation and you'll find yourself in hell throughout eternity and all this old crazy mess that has nothing to do with the good news. But yet, they claim they're the preachers of good news. Okay, well, I'd hate for, to hear the bad news if that's the case. Now, one of the words that you're going to see, and I'm going to go over just a couple of words that you're going you're gonna, to you're gonna get used to seeing. As I go into this here, you're going to see the word include because the title of this teaching is, or this message is Inclusion or the all-inclusiveness of God. To include means, because that's the root of inclusive, include, excuse me, it means to make somebody or something part of a group. God has made you a part of the whole. He's included you. He's included all of us. Apart from anything that you've done 
or that you haven't done. Now, a thesaurus, what it does for those who may not know, it speaks of words that are similar to the word that you're dealing with. So here we're dealing with in the word include. In a thesaurus, the word similar to that is comprise. In other words, the message that God, the good news that God has, it comprises all humanity. It includes all of us. It means to contain the all inclusiveness of God for God to include you and me and all of them. It means this message contains good news for all of us, each of us. Another word for include is to consist of the message, the good news. It consists of your name in my name, in his name, in their name, in all of our names. Another word is incorporate. God incorporated all humanity into this salvation, into this saving concept, into his all-inclusiveness. It means to rope in. You can see a cowboy on a horse and he ropes in a little calf or a cow or another horse. He throws that rope out there and rope in. Well, God roped in each and every one of us. To include means to embrace. You best believe that God has embraced each and every one of us. It's all inclusive. Now, the antonym of the word include, and this is what people talk about, but the antonym of a word meaning means like the opposite of the word. The antonym of include is to exclude or exclusive. (laughs) The antonym of inclusion is exclusion. Of inclusive is exclusive. To include, the opposite of it is to exclude. Do you know that's what the gospel has become? It's just become a message of exclusion. A message that leaves out all the important ones. All those who need it the most. (laughs) Now, the word inclusive, it means including everything. Mm. Everything in our situation, everyone. Inclusive, including everything, every sin, every wrong, every hellacious act, every Hitler. Huh. I wonder if every so called Satan and every so called fallen demon and every Judas. Huh? And everyone who committed suicide. Huh? Why does it have to be exclusive when it includes everything? Everyone. Everything that will keep you out has now given you the ticket to go in. The reason necessary for you to be a part of. Inclusive means not excluding any group, homosexual, lesbians, or the like. Not excluding any group or section of society. Mm, mm, mm. That's a shame that secular writers, secular minds put together definitions straight from their meaning and as supposedly people of light shedders of light we come about and we yell fake news about the definitions and then we add these new definitions in order to fit our theology in order to fit our group in order to fit how we believe inclusive means not excluding any group or section of society It's non-discriminatory. 
The message of God is non-discriminatory. It's without limitation or stereotypes based on gender. That's just the definition. And the thesaurus of inclusive is comprehensive, wide ranging, all encompassing, complete. The gospel of good news wouldn't be complete if it didn't include everyone. It's all inclusive. The antonym for it, meaning the opposite meaning of inclusive is narrow. Our gospel, the gospel that that the church world, the gospel, the good news, supposedly good news that the world is teaching is just narrow. It's just outright narrow. There's nothing wide ranging, all encompassing, comprehensive or complete about it. It's full of limitations and stereotypes including only certain groups and only certain sections of society is very, very discriminatory. And it definitely doesn't include everything and everyone. The word exclusive, because we're going to deal with the word exclude and the word exclusive. Exclusive means limited to a group of people. The gospel is not a exclusive especially one considered fashionable or wealthy we like rich people we like people who look like they're going somewhere certain churches certain groups they only like certain races certain ones only like certain sexes certain ones only like certain class brackets are you white collar are you blue collar worker do you have a hundred thousand dollars? If you make less than a hundred thousand, a hundred and fifty thousand, you can never be a part of our this, a part of our that. All of this crazy stuff. If you don't have a position on some board in the surrounding governmental system, then you, we don't need you. We don't need you over here. We don't need you over there. We determine how forgiving we'll be based upon, you know, what type clout, what what type pool you got, financial pool, class pool, whatever. Exclusive means excluding or intending to exclude many from participation or consideration. We exclude so many people from our groups, from our denominations, from our affiliations, from the good news. We're not going to go over there and preach the good news. We're not going to go over there and tell them this good news because we don't want them to be a part of our inherited rights. Or we, we won't even consider them. We won't consider that God considers them. Exclusive means only available to or used by one person or group or organization. Only my church is going. Only your church is going. Only my religious affiliation is going. Only us in us. No more. Now, the, the thesaurus of exclusive means elite. <laughs> Isn't that something? If, if the far right don't think that they are the elite ones of society. Select. You know, we're the select ones. We're the chosen ones. Called out. We're the ecclesia. The called out ones. Exclusive means restricted. Mm hmm. Limited, private. We surely believe that this thing is private, special. Antonym for exclusive, meaning the opposite of exclusive is inclusive. That's why I say the title, the all inclusiveness rather than exclusiveness of God. He's all inclusive. To exclude means to prevent someone or something from entering or participating. Again, the verse in the Bible that says, you don't want to enter in yourselves to this good news thought provoking area of revelation and you stop others who are wanting to enter from entering in. You don't want to participate in it. And so you stop others from participating in it. It's to prevent somebody or something from being considered or accepted. It's to fail to include something or somebody. 
the thesaurus of exclude means to keep out. Mm -hmm. We think we're doing God a service. The Bible says they'll do these things and they'll they'll crucify you and they'll ridicule you and they'll cut you off. And it says and they'll think they're doing God service. Doing God a favor, making God happy by what they're doing. So to exclude means to keep out or to leave out or to rule out, to bar from, to prohibit, to eliminate, to reject, uh huh, to stop, uh huh, to prevent. That's what the gospel of exclusion does. It does all of the spoken above things. But then the antonym, the opposite of exclude means to include. And instead of us including, we're excluding. We're making an, an, making it an exclusive country club. You know, it's a pay to play thing. You got to be a certain person, got to have a certain amount of money to play here. A certain amount of clout, a certain amount of skin tone or lack thereof to play here. It's not inclusive, it's exclusive. And that is not the gospel. That is not the gospel. And that is definitely not how the kingdom runs in the sense of how people are using it. So it's from that aspect of things that I want to begin to talk and shed some light on some things in regards to other things. I want to show where all of this is, how would I say, all of this is necessary as far as what's going to be said. And all of it is necessary as far as what it's going to disturb. I don't necessarily take it to heart that people will be disturbed by this message. I'm not going to worry myself over it. I know that it's something that God has placed in me on me to do. Therefore, I will do. And I don't hold anything back in doing so, being respectful as I can be, yet covering every base that I can at this point in time as to where I am in my personal revelational walk with God and truth, where I am, where I have achieved a level of truth that I'm able to finally speak forth and speak out to and against other things that are erected and being erected as being true. And understand also that in my speaking, in my teaching, in my conversations, I will definitely speak to the mindset the twisted mindset, the traditional religious mindset, the mindset of the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the religious leaders. I'll speak against your oral traditions, your written laws. I will speak against those things to make a point and to make a point only. And I don't apologize for that. It is what it is. It's high time for someone to challenge that within you. So let's begin to talk. Let's begin to go to scripture and let me build on the foundation of what I've already spoken. Let's get busy with it.